Okay, so uh, we are here with the polemicist and satirist, Sam Roffey. Welcome. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm really interested in generative art. It's something which has taken over the entire AI landscape over the last year or so. We've had models like Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey, and now everyone and their dog is generating art because all you need to do is prompt it. And there is a bit of a science to the prompting technique. So you can say Unreal Engine or Volumetric Lighting, or you know, you can put an artist's name in there. Sure. And it generates you a coherent, beautiful piece of art. But there's more to art than aesthetics, isn't there? Um, yes. It's like the the value or meaning of art. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And the fun, funny thing about it is to say, does generative art have value, say, or meaning? It doesn't really ask any different question of what is the meaning of art or what is art? Because however, it, I mean, it, has, it has an effect on the world, doesn't it? Generative art. You can make it. Mm. Someone can see it, like it or hate it. Mm. That's changed the world ever so slightly. Mm. So it has that value, doesn't it? Yeah. It has an effect on the world. But art must be more than that. Just a simple effect. I mean, what exactly defines the value of art? I don't think that's a that's one of those that's one of those questions that can't be actually answered. I would say, um, I do think it's got to refer to something which is, like you said, more than an effect on the world. Hmm. So what I'm getting at is that for it to be artistic, it's probably got to refer to something that's like sub subsuming or crystallizing the unintelligible. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Or, or, or even, uh, even referring back, like a, like a, what did I write here? Like a fireworks of remembrance. I put in this respect allusions to like the innate reasoning mechanisms that are in present day archetypes to our human survival. I mean, why are we attracted to certain things? Why are we artistically uh, aroused or, or, or rather artistically pulled, drawn to certain things? I mean, what are the, where's the value there? Now, I don't think we can, if we talk about value or meaning is that, that's beyond like physical, hmm. then, then, what we, then what we're talking about really, you know, has it got to have allusion to something mass, mystical or magical or almost godlike or infinite you know to to be art is, is that what you'd say well well the, you raise something interesting there which i think we'll get to later which is this um uh two substances mm. so there's this idea held by scientists now mm. that the physical world has what they call causal closure which means everything that exists mm. is explainable by things in the physical world. Yes. And you're alluding to there that there might be some pointer within art to what is in the non-physical world. But just before we get there, I mean, I think it's interesting to decompose art, yep. um, not only into the obvious box, which is the aesthetics, but you were touching on something interesting, which is the intention mm. And mental state, subjective experience of the artist. So it's almost as if the artist is trying to capture um, non linguistically, using the brush strokes, using whatever the yeah. medium is, something which alludes to their mental state. Mm. And yes, absolutely. And you might then say, well, if the person receiving the art, or should we say, uh, viewing the art, enjoying the art, do they have, does their experience have any relation? to the experience of the artist who created mm. it. I'm not even sure that's important necessarily. Why? Well, I mean, overlap, how you how would you how would we end how could we reduce that to find a how could we reduce that conversation to actually decide whether it overlaps anyway? Well, in the end it's just an effect it has on you, mm. I think the art. Mm. But say I as say me as the viewer, say me as the observer of the art, I might get an artistic um part of my artistic uh aesthetic because part of what i enjoy about art might be that somebody another human being out there mm. has constructed that and they constructed it like i said with their with their brush strokes with their intuition with their creativity with any of these human aspects mm. and maybe knowing that it's not from another human being means that part of part of what i wanted from the art is gone but then i'd have to know that in advance so if I didn't know that it wasn't, say you gave me something that looked like it could have been done by a human easily, and yes. I got, uh, then you said to me afterwards, Sam, you, you said all this, and then I've said, that, but that was created by a uh, generative model. Yes, yes, but, but, but it might be reductionist, because with language, it makes sense to talk about it as a form of compression. Mm. So what you do is, is you take an intention, and, um, and the reason we talk about semantics is because there is a bifurcation 
there's the form of language, which is the syntax, and then there's the meaning, which is the semantics. Yeah. And, and the idea is that the meaning can be reconstructed by the person, and it must be deducible not only from the form of the language, the words that I say, but also the world knowledge I have and, and reasoning ability and, and, and so on. But it, it might be overly reductionist to think of art as just being a form of compressed communication. Um because there's more to it than that. It's, it's, it's almost as if you were saying before that the artist knows it's a form of comp compressed communication and you're almost reflexively compensating for that communication uh, channel. Uh, explain what you mean by that. So um, should, should art be a form of persuasion? Mm. So it could be something that you don't necessarily expect the consumer to understand what you meant what you're doing is you're delivering a payload mm. which will have pressure in a certain direction mm. which you have some vague control over mm, okay yeah the question of what hmm. i don't know how to, how to go on from that one tim that's okay the question of like say does the art have have a value if it's just created by a by a uh, set of code does it have like a uh, is it the same well we we could go there a little bit because yeah. you could argue that there is still an intention there yeah so the person who created the art yeah constructed a prompt they had an intention yes exactly. they had a context yeah, yeah. right there is semantics what, yes yes good. and and also there's 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 another interesting attribute which is the people who create generative art mm. it's not one shot they iterate. Mm. They say, I'm going to generate 10 pieces and I'm going to choose that one and I'm going to choose that one. And I like those two pieces. So I'm going to create another piece which derives from those two right, pieces. Okay. And I'm going, to, I'm going to take the yellow dog out Second generation. with an orange dog. Mm. And it feels like the more interaction there is with the process, the more the artist can both claim to have um, created the art. Because part of this is about, oh, you don't need skills to make art anymore. But, but also there is a stronger intentionality behind the art. Yeah. And it's like, this, well, the, you do, do do still need skills to create the art, but the skills changed if you're just doing it through prompts. Hmm. But the skill potentially is far less, potentially. You know, you can create quite an interesting piece of art with just a few prompts because somebody's created the AI to do so. Well, what is the value of skill in art? Mm. Well, exact, again, do you, well, let's put it this way. Do you, when you find watching somebody do something extremely skillful, say, I don't know, juggling 11 uh, bowling, uh, what do they call it, bowling pins or something, mm. on, a, on a unicycle, smoking mm. a pipe, yeah, does this, do you think, wow, brilliant? Or does, that not, does, it, does it not interest you at all? No, it, it does interest me, and it does because it's scarce. Right, okay, so we, yeah. already, so we already have... We can accept a fascination of skillful people hmm. and go back to Rembrandt. Rem we did have photography. Rembrandt, Van Dyck, a few of these sort of Rembrandt was born in 1603, I think. So it's sort of like the 17th century or the late um, century before that, these Renaissance um, painters. Their skill not only was mesmerizing to us now, to us nowadays, it had much more of a pragmatic effect then because obviously, you know, back in that time, you hit 38. In your big estate, you think, well, I'm probably going to die very soon of some disgusting disease with my teeth right now. So I bet somebody better immortalize me soon you know, next to my uh, next to my grandfather's in the wall. Um, obviously, now because we have pictures, we don't rely on artists like that in the same way anymore. But we look back at, say, Rembrandt, mm. and we admire, or I do personally, again, I'm speaking on the we, but I'm more than happy that this is not the case. We admire how on earth, with a brush, with... With um, with paint and with glazes and with and with very little knowledge, the Flemish the Flemish method was always about there about there really. Did he create something that looks so vibrantly real mm. and seems to convey something beyond the, the, the realness? So what I'm saying is, Rembrandt was known to create um, a stylized painting, so very accurate. But he sometimes he'd be in a sh in, in a shade, or one of his eyes would be slightly different, and mm. it was always to have this sort of like effect that he was looking into you, or that mm. he he couldn't look at himself in that portrait. So there was like a bundle of information being given there. Um, but the skill, I'm actually I when I look at him specifically, uh, I think how did he achieve that? Um, how did he achieve that with with such a, with such with what you and me have? This yeah. is the difference, isn't it? We yeah. both have hands. We have access to brush. We have access to paint. But he did something with this skill level, 
which has mm. now does that give it does that give it a value and additional value is that a separate part of the value of a piece of art in, in your mind um it, it is it is and it's a value which has now been attenuated and eroded mm. because now anybody can create art like this i myself was enamored with ai art mm. Um, I've got it on the walls. Mm. I was obsessed with it at the beginning. I was generating lots of art pieces, and the models are significantly better than that now. You, you can know. you can generate photo realistic models. It's it's actually quite, quite an interesting new space that we're coming into. You can generate mm. photo realistic art. Wow! So art which is you know not of the real world that we live in, but still with mm. photo realistic mm. qualities, which is quite interesting. You know when you someone paints like not even a, maybe perhaps an not an abstract piece, but what we call an impressionist piece. Mm. Are you familiar with someone like um, Bacon? Francis Bacon or or, or um... well I was going to bring that in yes. because um, you were you were talking to the representational aspect of art and then we can diverge into representing what representing the world or representing yeah. the mind yeah. or both yeah. and when you are representing the mind that sort of leads into the impressionist artist and, and yeah. so on because they're, they're actually talking about whether well, they're capturing an abstract space which is not necessarily grounded in the real yeah because I suppose it would be also we'd be, be more talking about the expressionists and the surrealists because obviously mm. the impressionists were talking more about the Monet and, Monet and Manet mm. although they did things like that I'm talking more I suppose of that you know like when you paint someone and it's complete Guernica Mm. by Picasso mm. you know you've seen the massive Guernica which is like the, the, about war isn't it and all these sorts of uh, illusions to facial, facial shape but mm. they're, they're they're mutated yes and he's done it they're mutated and he thinks he's expressing the mutation of like pain rage mixed in with a face and that's this is this is the this is what he can see and how he can reflect represent all that by by, by experiencing that in him and then that's yeah. how his skill gets his ability to paint he gets um, commandeered by what he's trying to convey. Yes, is that something unique to human? That's the, that's, that's 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 another question. Well, I, in in a sense, it is because we talk about the Picasso problem in computer vision Do architectures, you? which is that when you take a face and you rearrange it, we still see it as a face because right. we have an abstract understanding of what a face ah, is. Interesting. And uh, models up until now, uh, some of them can recognise components. They they have this whole part relationship, and they have what we call in oh, so you can teach them to to look for elements of even if it's not in the correct configuration that's exactly right so every, every machine learning algorithm has these inductive priors and it's just a trick to reduce the space of possible things you can learn so in 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 this particular case the priors would be learning what we call translational symmetry which means that you can recognize an eye even if it's not in the right place globally because it's focusing on local information not global information gotcha. yeah. yeah okay interesting uh, and so, so go back to what I said. So go, going from the order of, this, of the skill aspects. So we've got mm. the skill yeah. and then we've got what you might be trying to convey beyond the straight skill. Yeah. Can a generative model convey something unique? Or can it just create something unique? That is the million dollar question. Mm. Yeah. To, to what extent are they creative? Mm. And cynically, to what extent are we creative? Mm. Um, Critics of these AI models say that they don't have the ability to form abstractions. Mm. And when you look at them, it's quite difficult to distinguish. We'll get into the whole mimicry thing later, but mm. um, the appearance of forming abstractions can be quite seductive. So there's always this question of, well, is it really? Is it really doing the abstractions? When you say it, you mean to work about computers particularly or humans as well? Um, well, both. Are, yeah. I, mean, I, I guess we can accept that humans can form abstractions. Because well, at least that's the thing we've created the definition from. Yeah. Human doing it is what yes. we've, we come up with the term abstractions because humans do it. It, 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 so in some respects, it's got that definitional um, correctness. That's right. But it, it's such a loaded term because when you yeah. speak to neuroscientists, they say that there's no bright line in the ability to create abstractions. They just say, you look at the brain, um, it's abstractions all the way down. Every single processing unit in the brain and the visual system, you're just kind of like learning these increasingly complex hierarchies of information. And you can think of the entire trajectory as being a line of abstraction. So consciousness would therefore be that, would it? Um, well, that, that I, I would say that's that's a very deep philosophical point. Some people say that consciousness is above dynamics. Right. 
So, it, and Chalmers says that it's a weird phenomenon because it doesn't have causal power over the rest of the system. It's like a, a it's like an epi phenomenon. So you have all of these dynamics in the brain, right? And, and the, the dynamics are this kind of reflexivity, this self monitoring, yeah. and that happens over successive layers of complexity, and then you get the so reflexivity is like the, the, you get a result from something, as it were, and you, and you feed, and you it, back feed it back into the feed it back into the formula or the algorithm. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's how. So that's how. That's how we what, become more sure of the world. Well, it's it's anyone's guess what the purpose of consciousness is, mm. and and even even then you can say well what's, what's again the, purpose very difficult question to get involved there, isn't it? Yeah, going into telos. Yeah. yeah, yeah, indeed. But let's let's bring it back to art just just, just for a moment. So yes, we yeah. we've spoken about the the value of art. So I believe that these generative models devalue art. Um, if anything, they've made me less interested in art, not more. That's a, right. That's a wonderful point because that's exactly how I would. I think that once the immediate notoriety of it's gone, or, mm. or novelty, not notoriety, novelty of it's gone, yeah. you then start thinking, well, you now we've now just systematized almost. We turned art into into water. We've tripped and then mixed it. it with the water of science. Yes. So now it's very difficult to. Now we're just saying it has an effect on the world again. Mm. We can create it. You can put it in your house. It can look look nicer. Your neighbor can like it. You can dislike it, or vice versa. It has an effect on the world. But it's got to have to be art for art to have a worthwhile definition mm. with a broad sense. It's got to, mm. art's got to do more than that. Yes. In some respects, the problem with it is though maybe it is like. I don't know if you know in the 1920s when the word jazz came about, the term jazz. It was almost like they created this this thing that didn't fit into any other category. Mm. So let's call it jazz. Yes. That's the, it's like, yes. Rather than it having like a, a, a straight root, it's more like things that came about that were sort of playing around formality. We call it jazz. It's things that have a relation to something we can't otherwise describe. That do we call that art? Yes, but one thing that, that, that you were touching on, which is interesting, sure. is, is if it has become trivialized, because we say, people like Chomsky say, that technology like this makes us lazy, and it sounds... Definitely like, de-skill, yeah. Well, it, it sounds like a charge of elitism, because you could just say, before, people used to really think about art, they used to interpret it, they used to yeah. think, you know... What 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 are what are the what are the strokes that weren't made? Can I read between the lines? Yeah. And now we've created this new generation of people who consume art like they consume Instagram, yeah. and it's almost like we are deliberately truncating their frame of reference. And the, and it because it's, and because you, with the social media paradigm that you can sort of flick through your social media feed and see seven bits of art you liked in a sixty seconds. Yes, art then because art then because something that sort of serves us serves our identity. Hmm. serves our aesthetic requirements like like you said like a cup of coffee or like a, a like like a uh, a comment on our post yeah i like that enjoy that enjoy that enjoy that whereas for me again meaningful art is when it takes me outside of myself it shows me something about myself hmm. but it takes me out there to do it hmm. hence i'm drawn to that art i don't see it as a uh, self-referential thing does that please me does that please me in fact i've been to a um, natural portrait gallery with a friend of mine who wasn't interested in art and I would say should remain so, because his way of judging art was whether it, whether it, he liked what it had done, what it what it had done. How do, I, how, how do I put that? He didn't really have any appreciation of the skill, particularly. He had no appreciation of great greater or grander motifs yeah. and ideas that might be conveyed through the art. Mm. When we got, and I don't know if you've ever been to the portrait gallery, but you can go through it chronologically, mm. so you can sort of go to those sort of you know, slightly flat. Med medieval plantagenet style kings stephen of bois and uh and, and henry the second they're sort of like a bit flat and face this is prior to the flemish method that mm. came about in the sort of 15th century yeah. so you, hence when you start looking at say da vinci even da vinci if you notice on the mona lisa it's quite flat mm. there is depth and it's created cleverly but it's yeah. not whereas when you get to the renaissance painters of the Ru people rubens and and everything's really rounded they've got the light and they use glazes to create real real um real depth um i I'm drawing all this from it, yeah? And I'm drawing the skills, and, and then I go through it. I'm going through, like I said, chronologically. We go through that flat period that I think, well, that's okay, but it almost looks like rudimentary, like infant humans' um, uh, art. But you get to that, I think, the peaked in the 1670 Renaissance period. There was no yeah. photography. Yeah. There was, uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the fear of death, disease, illness made people try harder. 
yeah. to, to raise above the poverty if possible. I mean, someone like Rembrandt didn't come for money. But if you've got a great skill back in them days, you can be patronized by by wealthy landowners and kings and queens, as he was. He didn't yeah. die with any money, unfortunately. But, you know, it gives you a chance to escape a world that isn't like ours of comfort and convenience. Mm. So perhaps that, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not even theorizing that particularly. I'm just, I'm, 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 there's a correlation maybe more than a, co more than a, co a, a, a causation, but definitely that's where I personally l l like art. It then became interesting. It went for the impressionist period of the 19th century, and then we get into the sort of what we call modern art. Now, I don't like all the blocks of color and the line and say that that represents melancholy. You know, not a yeah. fan of unmade beds and ashtrays as like a, a, an illusion or as a, a metaphor for, for the decaying of society. I, I think that they're taking the mickey now. I think they're turning art in itself as an expression of self-hatred. And I don't, I don't like that. We, 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 can, we, we can go back to that in, the few, in a minute if you want. But coming back to the period I was most interested in is that um, modern period. And there was some really interesting modernist, but not abstract particularly. They were well painted, but no longer were we going for this beautiful realism we were trying to say and do a bit more. And we got to this point, and my friend who's not interested in art went, yeah, I like that one. And I remember rightly, it was a, it was a, it was a, I think it was a portrait of someone from behind. So you didn't mm. even see any of their face. Mm. And it did convey, but what, 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 what showed me one thing is how different two people, me and him, yeah. could view the whole thing of art. He had an absolutely no objective interest in the skill or anything that the painting might be doing or saying. But you, you, you said something interesting there, which is your friend liked it. And to what extent should art be recreational versus having some utility? Yeah. Uh, it could be used for political reasons, yeah. for example. I don't think there's a should there, is there? <sighs> well, do you, mean, it's, sorry, it's, do you sort of mean ought, ought to be? Because I, mean, I, don't, I don't really believe, if art is what art is, I don't think we can pl place those sort of rules on it. Right, right. But, but then um, if you consume art... Mm. A lot of what we've been kind of brushing around here yes. is this concept of ontology mm. and also, you know, mostly aesthetics versus ontology. And ontology is about capturing, you know, the, the some kind of being. statement about the existence, the being of the artist. And this ontological space is infinitely large. So the consumer of the um, art, when they interpret the piece, can select trajectories through yes. that space yeah, of make, ontology that makes sense yeah and there's no bright line on what partition scheme should be used to select from that space of ontology so it could be something as simple as well this is this is how you were feeling emotionally at the time mm. as the artist mm. and this is my interpretation as as the consumer mm. but it feels like there's an infinite space of ontology yeah which maybe is the is the beauty of art in itself Mm. You know, maybe that is why it's so, 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 um, f so, f what would you call it? I mean, it's like a, it's something that's existed as far as we're aware in human times, human civilization, certainly, but way before that, I would guess, some sort of art exists. Yes, yes. But, but then, then you get to this thing about subjective experience in general. So one, yeah. one way of thinking about it is there's an asymmetry mm. between your subjective experience and my subjective Absolutely, experience. Absolutely, yeah. And also there's a miniature intersection of your subjective experience and my subjective mm, experience. Mm. Most of your subjective experience is, I mean, it's certainly not verbalizable, but it's also not experienceable in the, along the lines of Nagel's bat thought experiment. So, you know, we can't conceive of what it's like to be a bat. I also can't mm. conceive of what it is like to be you. Mm. And no. the interesting thing from an AI point of view is that these models do capture what appear to be subjective experiences and also they seem to have um, a kind of theory of mind for example they can reason about the beliefs and intentions of others and a lot of um, uh, psychologists have hold their hands up at this saying no that can't possibly be true but evidence seems to suggest otherwise mm. and then there's this thing that <clears throat> using language we can if we're clever Right, like Leo Tolstoy, right? We can encode subjective mental states into the form of language. And yeah. it is recoverable in mm. some sense, probably not in the same sense. So there's a receding horizon mm. of subjective experiences which are communicable, mm. generalizable, universal, right? Things which can be reconstructed in the mind of another person. Mm. But as the horizon goes out to sea, mm. the complexity increases and, exponentially. And I think that the first type, yes, I agree with what you're saying there, that first type of subjectivity, is mm. that the illusion of objectivity? 
So what I'm saying is, say that, say that, um, say that we all read this chat. We all read a, a read, read a, a, a paragraph from, mm. um, or, or maybe a, there's a great allusion he does to this uh, this metaphor of the of the breaking down of uh, Russian society after the French invade in um, Russia, mm. and he, he likens it to a long uh, extended uh, met metaphor of a broken beehive. And people, some of the worker bees, still trying to do stuff, even though there's no hive anymore, and the queen's dead, and the queen's left. Yeah, Imagine we were to all obviously have a unique um, subjective experience. Mm. Hmm. And then we've got these unique object, um, subjective experiences going on. Then we decide to converse upon it, and we all, within the, the language we can employ, seem to agree very accurately. This is what it is, this is what it's doing, this is what it's saying, this is what we get from it. These are some specific bits we like about it. That's hmm. better than that bit because, oh, Tim, I agree, actually. So he's even more specific. We might then be able to rationally say, well, it's still all subjective stuff. But is there, are we being almost... Um, almost lured into it as like it's, it's, it's as close as we're going to get to objective that was actually happening in that book that's why we all agree on it subjectively yeah um i mean f first of all I, I will articulate what i think is objective information so sure. and it all comes down to this concept of grounding mm. so when we talk about the alps mm. it's an object which exists mm. in the real world mm. But it's still possible to go and visit the Alps and have a subjective experience of okay, that. Yep. So, so then you get into this spectrum of information which is partially objective and partially subjective. So, but, but, okay, so is love, does love exist objectively? Because we will all have something to subject to. No. Yeah. No, because it's not grounded in in the real world, and that's the thing. Grounding is absolutely crucial. But then you can get. So that's into what I'm this. trying to say is we've got these other concepts we live by. Yeah. That we think we assume are objective. Yes. Because we often we say, "Oh, I love him. He loves me." But but then then you get into kind of emergentist grounding and symbol formation as Wittgenstein spoke of. So love is not grounded in the physical world, but it is grounded in the language game. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And I'm not saying that actually it does make it objective, but we desire for it to be objective, mm -hmm. like other things. We have like a natural tendency to to, to want to know what our world is. And it's yeah. let's be honest, we live in a world of the Alps and, and walls and cameras, but actually more of your time is spent up dealing with pain and love and guilt and all these other things that aren't as objective. Mm. The problem is then what we're doing, just swimming, swimming in a sea of endless subjectivity. It's very hard to create meaning when that's the case. And I yeah. think what art does is it crystallizes those illusions to infinite that we've got, those illusions to the never ending like reductibility of things and gives them sort of like an archetypal value for a bit. Do you know, it yeah. subsumes, it subsumes all the unintelligible thoughts, as I, as I said earlier, in a desire to make objective things that can't be objective. Yes, but two questions on that. First of all, why is there such a horizon of subjective encoding in our language? Because I feel that I understand what you mean when you say love, mm. even though how I experience it and what I interpret from it are yeah, the, the, completely different. Unlike the out, you can't point to love. You can point to an example of love. Yes, it's, it's, and then loves in that, like loves in that, like loves in that. Extract yes. love from all of them. No, no, that mountain is that mountain. Yes, but then I mean, it's, it's very similar to how we how we come up with categories in in the first place. We do it inductively. Yep. So we 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 take this package of 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 um, experiences that we have. We bundle it together in a category, and this is an emergent distributed process. So it happens in our language. It happens at the level of the society, and all of these cognitive categories get bundled up into these words and we kind of mm. um arrive on on what we think is a common understanding of, of a subjective category and the problem is it's it's glitchy it doesn't work right so if i if i say to you elon musk is rich is rich right you you, you seem to understand what i mean mm. right um we seem to have a common understanding of what it means to be rich what a pile of sand is mm. right but if you start pushing on these concepts you don't have to push very far for it to just blow yeah. up into vagueness. Mm -hmm. so, it has, so it has sort of a value at a certain scale. Mm. Then when you break it down, try to reduce yeah. it down to its yeah. components, yeah. at that point you can't look at it with the same, you can't look at it with the eyes you looked at it at the previous scale. Mm. It's, it's, exactly. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a I don't, resolution. Yeah, so I mean, on a practical sense, when you say Elon Musk is rich, like you said, I know I could theoretically start breaking down some stuff there, but there's no point, is there? Mm. In my world, I just, yeah. That's one of the things that I would use. I mean, we all agree that if you've got 200 and something billion pounds, you're rich. Yeah. He is known as the richest guy in the world. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to argue that, you're going to argue everything forever, aren't you? So in some respect, we just accept that as a provisional package of information that's acceptable at that scale.
Because we're not actually doing the semantics there. We're not breaking down rules. We're not breaking down words, concepts. How does that link to that in the real world? You know, this sort of, or the Aristotelian third man thing. Mm. Where is the link between the, the form, the idea, the essence, and the example? Because yeah. that seems to require endless number of links mm. to, actually, mm. to, to keep them remaining in the same ex existential field. Yes. Um, but we don't do that. In the same way, we just accept stuff, don't we? We have to accept it because it's like, it's like asking your question, are we free? Do we have completely free, do we have free will or do we have determined determined um, thoughts? I mean, I've got no idea. Perhaps that question, the mistake is in the question itself. Perhaps like only our, our language is, is glitchy. <laughs> when we get to that dichotomy, we just create a glitch. Are we yeah. infinite or finite? And a glitch there. I mean, this is what um this is what Wittgenstein thought, isn't it? In some respects, whereof we cannot speak, thereof we must pass over in silence. There's certain questions like dead ends, illegal moves in the language game. Yeah. They they they, they do nothing. But we're full of them. Like you just said, any sentence, if broken down at a different scale, it leads to seemingly endless, if not infinite, um, uh, infinite uh, permutations, ways of yep. looking at things, yep. aspects. Yep. yep. So there is, we're now saying we're continuously confronted with so many built-in infinities, built-in sort of lacking of definitude, of, of actual finite definition, meaning, value. So yep. where are we getting it from? Yeah. Perhaps that is where we'll be, what we use art for. And listen, we're looking at paintings a second ago, but there's so many other forms of art, whether it comes from music's probably the, the purest form. Because hmm. like as, as, as Kierkegaard said in the uh, section of the book Either Or, there was the immediate stages of the erotic. Hmm. And he basically said, Don Giovanni is the greatest piece of art, not music, art. Art's the highest form, music's the highest form, and Don Giovanni's the best. And what he was trying to explain was that when the music's on, you're... When you're in an in a, in a arena listening to Don Giovanni, your body is literally, every cell of your body is vibrating, as it were, with the music. You're experiencing it there and then. It's a, mm. a specific, unique moment. When you listen to it next time, it's the same notes. It's a new moment again. Yes. Turn it off. The vibrations stop. You can then take a pen and write for as long as you want to describe what you just experienced. Yeah. You're not describing what you just experienced. You're describing a verbal a written description. Vicarious experience. Exactly. And, and he was just trying to show that the, 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 the lack of effect, um, the weakness of words when describing sensations. Hmm. And more importantly, the art itself is a moment that happens uniquely at that period, especially when it's something like music. Hmm. And it could be the same with paintings. And people say, oh, I've looked at it again for the 50th time. I saw something new this time. I mean, yeah. the desire to go back, the desire to feel it. Now, linking back to what I was just trying to say, why do we have a desire? Could be the meaning thing. Like what you just said, I mean, we, we, we do create these, okay, we're just going to say, like, we're just going to say that if I drop this, it will fall. That Newton's correct. Hmm. Even though when we look at science generally, we come to that falsification theory. We come to uh, yeah, science, scientific theory must be falsifiable. Yes. It yeah. must be, potentially, one day won't happen. It won't be the case or can be improved upon. But we don't bother questioning whether the science is going to fall anymore. We just accept Newton's law of gravity there, as it were, or rather what it will just fall to the floor. We don't think, oh, what, maybe one day it will go up. So it's, it's not that um, there seems to be apparent meaning and certain and certain level of certainty to things. Although when we try to understand what that certainty and meaning comes from or it's composed of, hmm. we just get lost in, like you say, a sea of subjective, a sea of non-certainty. Yeah, and there's something about the sea which is very deep and meaningful. So um, hmm. when, I, when I speak to some AI researchers, they say, that the concept of infinity doesn't exist. Yes. And actually, if you want to have a bright line between different schools of thought in artificial intelligence, that would be it. That would actually be it. So Chomsky is yep. a big believer in infinities, yep. and his Chomsky hierarchy draws a bright line between the recursive languages, for example, and the, ki the kind of languages that can be produced by these large language models. And um, a lot of people misunderstand the Chomsky hierarchy. It's not about the set which can be generated from a computational model. It's about the ability to recognize that a model in a in a different part of the hierarchy generated a certain type of, of language. But he thinks that language is infinite and the way that we process it is recursive, which is the most sophisticated form of computational model. Now, folks who are into these large language models and AI models they, I mean, these models don't do recursive processing. They do recurrent processing, so they can't um, recognize or produce recursive languages, which means that they are a truncated form of of, of language model, essentially. And, and he thinks that we humans, mm. when we speak, when we think, mm. with this recursive processing, mm. we are traversing an infinite space. Mm. 
and when we experience art, we're traversing through this infinite space, and that gives us wonder. And the wonder is because of the asymmetry. Mm. When we form abstractions, when we experience art, we are traversing this sea of what is basically ontology. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it, it is. It's functionally or practically infinite. But to us, yeah, the amount of things you can possibly say, think. Yeah, I mean, in, infinity is an interesting one. You know, there's yeah. there's, there's the um, the Hilbert's Hotel um, thought experiment, but it, it's something which well, we'll just yeah. take 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 go back to your, what we talk about pain or um, or love again. Yeah. Okay. So take love has the, the imagine we sit on a two D plane that we just do a circle with the word love or pain or pain in these two concepts, mm. which are obviously mm. expressed only by reference to painful or loving scenarios. That's how we generate our idea of what love or pain is. Um, it's, it's 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 finite. Because not everything is love, by definition. There are things that aren't love. Yeah. It's not like, oh, everything's love. No, no, no. There's all well, pains, for example. You know, joy isn't pain. It's you know, toothache's pain and stubbing your toes pain. They're different. They're both painful. The, you know, other things aren't. So it's, so it's a finite concept. It's, only got, it's, it's got a certain size to things that can be included. But is it, is it, are there infinite examples? Is there, are there a limited number of painful things? No, there's an infinite number. That's what I'm saying. So you, you, you've you got a limited... It's almost like going left around the, the, the globe forever. It's a limited framework of an infinite time or going around the, the Monopoly board. You know, theoretically, it's not going to stop me going around the Monopoly board. I can go on forever. Or it's only, it's only, it's only held back by the length of time of the, in existence. But then that would be infinity. That would be the infinite question coming back on again anyway. Um, but there are, there are infinities everywhere. So there's yeah. infinities in the vagueness of the boundary of the concept. Yeah. There's also an infinity in terms of the way it can be composed with other concepts. So you can feel pain in different situations, different mm. types of pain, two types of pain together. Sure, it's sure. That's what I'm trying to... Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so as far as... Like, like we're free, aren't we? We might be predetermined, but not in a way we can understand. Mm. We're free. Mm. It's like, yeah. you know, there's a hundred, a hundred trillion cells in your body. I mean, you can't even come up, come up with a uh, formula, as it were, an algorithm to explain where we're going to be in three or four seconds, let alone, you know, where we're going to be in the future. Yeah. So therefore, we, we can, whether it's free or, the predet predet uh, or predetermined, that question is no longer a relevant one for us. So, mm. in, I mean, we can talk about it uh, like in a, in a um, meta meta metaphysical sense for fun. Uh, for like you know, creating the language gives us more places to play in the playground. It's fun. It's it's, it's enjoyable. It's, it gives value and meaning to my life to think about you know all, all, all these various questions. But no, I mean you just assume you're free. Even people who are even people who argue, it would seem Sam Harris's who argue for determinism, actors are actors are they free? Yeah. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And you, and you said something interesting as well because um because you you do a lot of um uh, satire and comedy, and a lot of that is about deliberately playing with the cognitive apparatus. Mm. So it's, um, you know, deliberately creating ambiguity and kind of forcing the audience in, in one direction, nudging them in one direction. And then, and the, and then you ripping, pull, you rip the curtain away. You rip yeah. the curtain away, exactly, yeah. yeah. Oh, and obviously you've got the, the word. It's funny because it, it some of the greatest satirists, my favourite ones as well, were like the ones who are brilliant with words. Yes. You know, and, and the, double, the double meanings of things. Yes. And, um, oh, there was one where a man said, he, he, he says, he's talking about a lady, she says she must go, she has to go, Barbara has to go home now mm. because she's having... The man coming to uh, check her, um, having the man come to check the attic, and there's nothing she likes more than being, than having, than having felt laid down. No, the being, no, than getting felt laid down in the loft. <laughs> Which is, the, you know, and obviously now I like that because, like you said, you're taken off somewhere on a tra tra traditional trajectory. It's just a yeah. woman going to meet the guys going to come and check the loft. Yeah. But then yeah. she likes getting felt laid down in the loft. Yeah. That's beautifully beautiful. Like it just comes in. And takes over, and then that's what we start to laugh, don't we? We, we laugh because we oh, I didn't see that one coming. Yes, yes. 